Hello, everybody. This is JC Watson over at HIPS. Um, thank you, everyone, for calling in to the 13th installment of the HIPS Brown Bag series. Uh, we got a super awesome presentation today. James Leary is going to be talking about some really, really neat stuff. Um, so, yeah, without further ado, James, uh, take it away. And everyone else, please uh, put your uh, phone on mute. All right, great. Thanks, JC. Appreciate the opportunity. Lucky number 13, I see. Uh, ending the year out with a bang. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating um, and giving an opportunity to share with you updates uh, uh, on our research and science and management. Obviously, uh, most of you know me and you know what I've been working on and who I've been working with. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Myconia management in East My Watershed and the partnership uh, uh, with the Maui Invasive Species Committee, also the exotic plant management team of the National Park Service, and several others uh, who have uh, started and carried on the history and tradition of Myconia management in East Maui. It's, uh, several battles have been won, but it's a long war. It's, I want to kind of change pace, obviously, inherently I'll be talking about HDT as a technology, herbicide ballistic technology, for those who don't know. But I also want to, I want to present a unique opportunity to share basically the entire history of management, um, which is really unique and it's uh, really a testament to those who have uh, led the effort um, in its entirety. So. Um, I want to acknowledge, obviously, the Maui Invasive Species Committee, uh, some of my other partners, including Brooke Mankin, who helped a lot with the data management and the data analysis. You know, I've worked together quite a bit on that. Uh, and my other partners, Kim Burnett and Chris Wada of the UH Economic Research Organization, and uh, also my graduate student and colleague, uh, Roberto Rodriguez and Daniel Jenkins. So without further ado, the title of today's talk is The Science of Myconia Management in the East Maui Watershed, A Brief History and Bioeconomic Projection of the Future. So if some of you saw my presentation at the Conservation Conference in July. Some of it will be reiteration, but I, will, uh, I am happy to say that we updated it with new information, so uh, I hope this is uh, interesting and useful for you. Okay, some of the learning outcomes we'll be talking about today, the biology of an invasive species, the history of myconia invading the East Maui watershed, concepts in aerial surveillance, GIS analysis of operations, uh, and metrics of operational performance. Invasion biology of myconia. Many of you are quite familiar with it intimately uh, in the field and also scientifically in the literature. Uh, we are uh, graced with an abundance of scientific literature on myconia, and it has paid its dividends quite well. And it's very, some of the oldest literature is still extremely useful. Uh, we understand myconia as an autogamous species, meaning it's self fertile, it doesn't need a cohort to pollinate and reproduce. It produces, it's highly fecundous, it produces millions of seeds in a single uh, reproductive cycle. Uh, the fruit are small and edible uh, and are consumed by avifauna and, and other uh, generalists. Um, so, uh, and this lends itself to a dispersal um, that can exceed 1,000 meters. Uh, seed bank viability, according to the literature, is over 20 years and it can germinate in heavy shade. With that, all that said, a single myconia plant can impact over 1,000 hectares of protected watershed. That's the severity of this invasive species. Myconia fecundity and seed bank longevity. Here you'll see on the, on the left-hand side, we have three graphs. We have a graph on fecundity or fruit production, we have the middle graph is a graph on dispersal and a graph on viability. Fecundity, as according to the literature, a, pan, a, a fruiting panicle can produce up to 200 fruit containing 200 seed each. That's 40,000 live propagules. Uh, myconia reaches maturity in three to four years. Uh, and the minimum 
Uh, the smallest uh, fruiting plant observed was two panicles. So that's an estimate, an estimate of up to 80,000 feet or 400 fruit within, uh, within first reaching maturity or early mature. Uh, and this can occur within the first three years. Uh, or, uh, one million seed can be produced within the first three years. So this graph indicates the exponential or nonlinear growth uh, expansion of seed bank or, uh, due to a single plant. <clears throat> Dispersal kernel, uh, by definition, is the biological movement of propagules, uh, in this case through gibberous avifauna. Uh, this graph in the middle is the dispersal function, or what's called the kernel density, of uh, propagules, the frequency distribution of propagules from a mature plant. And you can see on the x-axis the distance from that mature plant. And so obviously, uh, most of the propagules are going to fall off the tree. And then you have these rare, uh, these rare long distance events uh, in, uh, enabled by uh, avifauna and frugivory. This is data that was recorded from Fletcher and Westcott 2013, so a recent publication, and this was data collected in Australia, North Queensland. And so you can see the longest dispersal event recorded was over 1,400 meters, but with over 90% of the propules falling within 300 meters. So this is what they would call a, a fat-tailed dispersal kernel. Again, these rare long-distance events. And it has a what's called a leptokurtic function with a really strong peak near, near the zero point. So that's just me getting technical. But if a, a mathematician or statistician was sitting in, they'd call me out for being kind of a dork. Um, OK, so the bottom graph is seed viability. And this was a study conducted by John Hughes Mayor uh, published in 2009, and, but it was, a, it was a seed bank study where he had seed buried in a, in a location in the ground and then extracted these seed bags and germinated to determine viability. And so this was uh, published in 2009 in the Proceedings of the International Mycenae Conference uh, that took place in Maui. Uh, but he started it 16 years prior, and so you can see on the x-axis x-axis is month, and the y-axis is the number of seeds germinated. Uh, you can see at, the, at time zero and time one, they were high viability, uh, over 4,000 seeds germinating. Uh, and then at the four-year mark, you can see uh, a lower number. And then obviously, at the 16-year mark, which is, again, this is at months, but this is at the 16-year mark, the last point, still showing viability. So at least anecdotally, demonstrating viability beyond a decade and up to two decades. And then shows this decay function, this modest fit of a decay function, uh, where eventually uh, this seed bank would go extinct. OK, moving on. The invasion history of Myconia in Hawaii. The timeline for Maui is back in the 1970s. Uh, this is likely uh, uh, introduced in Hana as a botanical specimen. Uh, some of the literature says early 1970s, and others says late 1970s, somewhere in the 1970s. That's our starting point. A, basically, a single introduction uh, at a botanical garden or horticultural uh, nursery, uh, which is where this was introduced in Hana. Uh, in the 1980s, um, conservationists in Hawaii became aware of this problem in Tahiti and Morea uh, and were very concerned. And in 1991 is when Myconia was identified and recognized in Hana. Uh, it was first identified and then immediately recognized as a problem. So very briefly, you can see from 1970 to 1990, Myconia basically being introduced and growing unchecked without any knowledge of the potential problems this may have. So two, de two decades of naturalizing and naturalization and dispersal. 1991 is when the Mellisome Action Committee uh, was formed. This is the, uh, this is, uh, which eventually became known as the Maui Invasive Species Committee. Uh, so this is a, a historical uh, time point for a lot of folks. 
uh, involved in invasive species management in the state, first invasive species committee, and it and it spawned from the Mellowstone Action Committee acknowledging and identifying Mitronia as a serious problem to be addressed. In July 1991, uh, this was the first volunteer effort to, at, where uh, they manually removed over 9,000 plants at the point of introduction. 9,000 plants. From just a few specimens being brought in, in two decades, they already removed 9,000. Just putting that out there. On the right, you see this classic invasion curve where it shows this logistic growth model, which is typical for most biological organisms, including plants, and, and, um, and time periods of when actions would occur and what you could feasibly accomplish based on the growth and naturalization of an invasive species. Where prevention happens before species is introduced, eradication is still feasible after introduction <laughs> in small localized populations, and then obviously containment with larger naturalized infestations, um, and then eventually advancing to or retreating to resource protection or asset protection for long-term management. The least desirable, but still uh, calculated as a, a worthy um, return of an investment. And obviously the most expensive form of management, I think we're all in agreement on. So uh, moving on, I guess I, I pose this question. Where would Myconia invasion on Maui fit on the classic invasion curve? Knowing that in 1991, there was already 9,000 plants at the point of introduction. Just posing that out there, I don't have an answer. Okay, our, our canvas, the East Maui watershed. Critical habitat, it's uh, 50,000 hectare watershed, on, mostly on the windward slope of Paleakala, uh, reaching the coastline at zero feet elevation all the way up to the summit at over 10,000 feet. It has the several uh, points in this area ha are some of the wettest spots in the world um, and produces over 60 billion gallons of fresh surface water. Uh, an amazing and an abundant natural resource in this day and age. I'll take water over oil any day. So this is extremely fab fabulous and really important uh, and cannot be overstated. Um, critical habitats, over 100 rare and endangered plant species and other and other T and E species, birds, and, um, and so again an, uh, another important attribute of this natural resource, this uh, this watershed landscape but only 50,000 hectares. Okay, so here's where Myconia was introduced in the eastern port most portion of the island, just outside of the watershed. And as we move, progress, here's the points recorded in 1995. Can you believe it? Like these guys were so sophisticated, they were using GPS back in 1995. This is, this is really, uh, interesting and uh, extremely useful today. Uh, hey, you know, hey James, this is JC. Uh, the points yeah. are, are not showing up. The points oh, don't show up? There they are. It just clicked over. Okay, never mind. Okay. All okay. right. Okay, so this is 1995. Here, I don't know if you see my arrow, and so it's uh, too bad, but uh, the, the point of introduction in HANA, and you can see how far out it's already being recorded. Some of the most extreme outlier points, and others can speak more intelligently about these points than I can, but these were probably human-mediated introductions. Uh, it was an ornamental species, and so they were probably planted purposely uh, at several of these points. That's 1995. Moving on, here's what 2001 looks like. This is when the National Park Service really ramped up efforts and really took a uh, lead in management at a larger scale. This is just the starting point. You can already see advancement of uh, spread, and you can even see a point here uh, in West Maui, which is uh, a big no-no. This is a real cause for concern, uh, but that was an early introduction. Again, human-mediated, not bird dispersed. But you can see already a lot of the area filling in. 2006, you can see the numbers starting to increase with the management, and then 2011, 
when uh, this is basically when I, uh, a couple years after I moved to Maui and became much more familiar uh, with the problem and started to really collaborate with the agencies, in particular uh, the MET and the Park Service in, in understanding the problem and coming up with new solutions. This is what 2011 looked like. You can see the spread and distribution of a, a pretty advanced invasion of this plant species. <clears throat> so from 1991 to 2012, there's over 270,000 plants recorded with aerial and ground management efforts. Uh, so we so far have described two decades of unchecked growth, and here we have another two decades of management imposed, so a complete history of myconia introduced to Maui before and after management. Um, from two, starting in 2012 is when I uh, entered the picture in collaboration with these teams uh, where we introduced uh, herbicide ballistic technology as a platform, an aerial platform for targeting incipient, remote incipient populations that were otherwise very difficult to access. It really improved our management of these particular populations. You can see these yellow points highlighting our efforts to um, move back and, and focus on containment, where previous to that, all efforts were towards eradication. So from 2012 to 2016, we have over 20,000 points recorded uh, with over 600 hours of flight time dedicated to these operations. Herbicide ballistic technology, I have already described the technology invented in Hawaii for Hawaii with intent to uh, eliminate individual plants with aliquots of herbicide using a pneumatic device or a paintball marker um, with uh, effective range within 30 meters. Uh, this allowed us to go after the most difficult, inaccessible population in the East Maui watershed, which that landscape has plenty of problems with, with regard to access. Um, where it really changed the game is it was one thing to be able to treat these individual, in, individual plants, but it really encouraged uh, a, a new mindset in how we dedicate resources to surveillance, looking for these individual plants and how and the value of going after these particular targets. So I kind of already introduced the concept, uh, the problem, and the objective to detect and eliminate incipient populations and effectively contain the spread of myconia in East Maui watershed. That's, that's how we deployed HVP and that's how we are continuing to use this system. And it couldn't have happened without uh, registration, which was the long, arduous, boring aspect of it. Um, doing the battery of tests to prove, uh, prove efficacy and utility. Um, and of course, this is an expired, or this, this is an expired 24C and we recently got a new uh, five-year lease on HVT uh, registration. So we will have uh, up to 10 years of using this technology. We're just in the first year of a five-year uh, new 24C. Uh, by the way, the active ingredient for, tri uh, for HVT is uh, triclopyr. It's Garlon 4 Ultra, which most of you know. It's a Swiss Army knife of herbicides and a lot of conservation work. Uh, and it is Myconia's Achilles heel. It's highly sensitive to Garlon, so you can use very small aliquots to administer an effective and lethal dose. HVT operations, uh, aerial deployed with a Hughes 500. Uh, with applicator seated port side behind the pilot so that two are sharing a uh, field of view, scanning for targets, and effectively trading upon detection. Uh, low altitude flight patterns following the contour. Uh, operational flight times in a fuel cycle are anywhere from 80 to 90 minutes, 1,200 bucks an hour, or 30 cents a second. It's extremely expensive and you got to cover a lot of ground, and when you do, it actually prices out to be quite economical. This is, uh, this is a GIS presentation of contour flying, following the, the contour of the landscape, searching the crevices and cracks for those 
small, incipient, isolated populations. You can see two larger naturalized populations in Waiamoku and Wahiamalu. In the, um, this is in the southeast corner of the island, just, just before Kipahulu. Uh, but then in between, uh, dedicating a significant amount of resources, looking for two or three more plants, again, with the impact factor of that one plant reaching maturity and impacting another 1,200 hectares. Okay, so you'll remember in the slide where I present the Australian data on the dispersal kernel. And so we also took all of the data from 1992 to 2011 and all the HPT data from 2012 to 2016 and we did a, what's called a near neighbor analysis where we identified the distance of each point to the nearest mature plant. And so this is plotted out as a dispersal kernel or probability density function with target proportion on the y-axis and distance in meters from the nearest mature plant on the x-axis. And what you can see is the black line is, is uh, historical Iconia data. The red line is, is HBT Myconia data, all from the East Maui watershed, and then Fletcher and Westcon's data from Australia. And what, you're, what you should notice is it's really hard to distinguish the lines because they're almost identical. And so this is really fascinating. It's basically, I'll stop short of calling it a univer universal, but really brings home the point of our empirical data describing the spatial distribution of Myconia in the East Maui watershed, matching up with a separate population in a different location on the globe. Really fascinating and, and you know, with published literature, and so really gives us confidence and strength in adapt, adopting this spatial analysis for interpreting the impact area. And so some of the take home points is the, the functions are identical, with uh, well over 90 per so 90% uh, of these points fall within 170 meters. So more like right here, this is about 90%, 95% uh, and about 300 meters. So most of them within, within uh, 200 meters. Um, but long distance events, uh, the longest uh, event for HPT was 1,600 meters, again compared to uh, Australian data at 1,400 meters. And then for uh, historical Myconia data, up to 1,980 meters. So all comparable, but it definitely influences um, the total area of impact, obviously. The further the distance, the larger the radius, the more area that could be impacted. So these were, uh, these were functions that were created with over 100, almost 120,000 points. That's significant. And that's, again, a testament to the high quality data collected starting back in the 90s up until today. And that shouldn't be understated. That's really valuable and it allows us to make this presentation. Very simple graph, but really powerful. Here's another interesting piece of information that's new, and this was not introduced in July. So we talked about the spatial distribution. Now let's look at the temporal distribution. Um, and uh, let's see. This is seed bank longevity in Tahiti, uh, produced by uh, experiments from Dr. Mayor uh, and the East Maui watershed. So similarly, okay, so you'll recall this is the same graph on the left that was presented in the second slide. This is Dr. Mayor's work showing this decay function over, I, excuse me, I converted it to days, 6,000 days or 5,840 days is equivalent to 16 years. Okay, let's just uh, make that imprint. The orange line with the red dotted line is the temporal relationship of all the Myconia points associated with the nearest mature point. So the number of days after the mature point, which would assume recruitment after the mature point. So let's just say you, you treated a mature plant in 2012, and then you found a recruit right next to it in 2014, that would be upwards of 720 days or two years. So subsequent to the mature plant, the nearest associated mature plant, this is how this is plotted out. This is all GIS, basic arc GIS. And what this shows is a fit of a decay function 
of 120,000 points associated with uh, the different mature plants, and it shows a decay function that is strongly correlated to the decay function that Mayor uh, discovered in a separate experiment in Tahiti using different methods. So what this says, what our data says in the Eastern Watershed is that that this decay function shows uh, almost uh, complete, uh, it shows uh, identical decay function that would reach out to extinction anywhere from 20 to 40 years. So this just shows the 15 year mark, but when you play it out to less than one target remaining, that's what this shows. And so now we have high quality spatial distribution, knowledge of spatial distribution of mycelia and high quality knowledge of the temporal distribution related to seed bank longevity and recruitment that should occur. This is, you put those two together and we can figure a lot of things out in terms of what is happening, what happened in the past and how things should play out in the future. Okay, moving on. Uh, okay, I didn't read my own notes, but yeah, PDF shows the K function can grow to Tahiti and 99% depletion or mortality in 20 years with extinction estimated between 20 to 40 years. So this, so far what I've shared with you guys is basically conventional understanding among the group. Uh, congratulations, our science proves what you uh, always assumed and, and, and operated under. And so I think this really substantiates how we've operated. And so it really says we haven't done anything wrong so far. We, we seem to be doing it right. Um, that doesn't mean that we're winning. It just means we're doing it right. Moving on. Okay, this this slide is always hard for me. I'll see if I can like uh, spit it out. Okay, so now we have knowledge of the Myconian biology. How does this translate to management performance? Uh, as a weed scientist uh, that studies the, the science of management. Um, I subscribe to a, uh, a term uh, coined by Dr. Oscar Cacho. He's an economist out of Australia. Uh, he's published on Myconia. He describes what's called the mortality factor, which is the basic assumption of mortality is the product of the probability of detecting the plant multiplied by the product of being able to effectively treat the plant. So, for instance, HBT is known to be 98% effective. Of all the plants we've treated, less than 2% of those plants were recorded as survivors and retreated. So 98% of our treatments were shown to be effective. We have a highly effective platform. However, our probability of detection, we know is less than one. We can go into an area, search an area and find 100 plants, and then come back any time, anywhere between four to six months, six weeks later, where we'll find the plants that we treated, they look like they're necrotic and dying from from symptoms related to triclopyr, and but then we'll find right next to it new plants. Those new plants are one of two things: they are plants that were missed in the previous operation, or they're new recruits. Now, in a time interval within a month it's highly unlikely that those plants are new recruits. Plant, Micronia grows pretty fast, but not that fast. So a lot of the plants that we'll find in our second, second iteration are, in fact, undetected in the previous operation. They were there, and we missed them. And this is not uh, impractical. I mean, these are very difficult terrain to cover. Um, you know, weather is always an issue, uh, and we're just human. That's what we are. Um, and so... But what's really interesting is Cacho adopted uh, concepts from search theory, and so what what he described and what we're noticing in our operations are what are called random search efforts, uh, where a, the function it fits this uh, fits this nonlinear curve where you have an asymptote where you never reach a probability of detection equal to one, uh, and our empirical data tend to follow fall on this pretty basic equation for describing a random search effort uh, where our efforts are imperfect. And in fact, we know how imperfect they are. We're not trying to be perfect, we just want to know how imperfect we are. So for instance, one encounter in, in, in a location, we are finding approximately 60% of the plants in that area. 
In order to find over 98% of those plants, we'd have to visit three times in succession to find 98% of those plants in that location. So let's put that in the back of our minds in terms of how you would compensate your, your imperfect detectability with higher frequency of intervention. Um, the other point, uh, the other points to make are the trigonometry of, of aerial surveillance. Again, we have a three-person crew searching out of a Hughes 500 with the doors off at a low altitude, approximately uh, anywhere from 30 to 100 meters above ground, um, and with the doors off. And we're looking at an oblique angles on slopes that are typically anywhere from 20 to 70 degrees, so extreme terrain. It's inaccessible by ground. Uh, and so this last uh, graph here shows the central macular vision, your eyeballs. The central macular vision is a 17-degree field of view, FOV, and, it's, uh, and it takes on a lift shape based on the landscape that you're looking at. You can see uh, the x-axis is the slope. So as slope increases, your field of view stretches out. Uh, but for the most part, most of our uh, uh, slope search area is within 30 to 60 degrees. Uh, less likely to be in the 80 to 90, that's uh, very extreme, and then we're generally not flying over flat ground. The median is at about 39 uh, degree slope, and what, I'm, what I want to point out is that our field of view, uh, the area that we are looking at when we search the landscape with our eyeballs is approximately 100 square meters. This is what we this is what we're looking at when we are observing the landscape. And what's uh, convenient, anyways, is in GIS most of our raster layers are 10 by 10 meter pixels or 100 square meter pixels. So our field of view when we're scanning the landscape with a helicopter is equivalent to searching and looking at one pixel. So it makes for a convenient interpretation. So effort related to treatment of targets and search effort to find those targets to establish a mortality factor that's measurable is really what we're striving for in the operational science. So with that type of information, uh, the flight time committed and the targets treated and the amount of herbicide used to treat those, we are able to generate the variable cost of operation as it relates to target density encounter. We have two graphs here, scatter plots. On the top, we have, um, we have search effort on the, in, measured in seconds per hectare. And on, uh, and on the x-axis, we have target density, target per hectare. In fact, for both of them, target, uh, target density. On the top graph, we have search effort as it relates to seconds per hectare. It has this nice linear function with a pretty strong R-square. This, uh, um, this simple linear equation shows the slope and the y-intercept. The y-intercept tells us when we're not finding targets, it takes us 83 seconds to search one hectare. That's, that, that's uh, valuable information because time is money, but especially with a helicopter, and that equates to $24.90 per hectare just to use flight time searching for targets, whether you're finding them or not finding them. For every target encounter, it requires another 40 seconds to engage that target and treat it uh, at, at a cost of $12 per target in flight time. Herbicide, uh, again, fits a nice linear function with target density where the slope function is now equivalent to the dose per target. Our average dose is 4.3 grams of acid equivalence, which is the amount of active ingredient, which is approximately 22 projectiles at 31 cents a piece, what pretty expensive. Every target treated costs $6.71 plus the flight time at $12, which is $18.17 per target. In any other weed management situation on the planet, this is astronomically priced. But that $18.17 per target is also protecting a radius of, of 2,000 meters, which is equivalent to 1,200 hectares of highly valuable forested watershed. Moving on. Okay, so going back to that dispersal function, uh, we're able to spatially assign an impact area. So again, our longest distance uh, uh, 
uh, dispersal event is 1,980 meters, uh, which is equivalent to 1,232 hectares as displayed here. 10% um, of those crop fuels are occupying 99% of the total area. Um, sorry, this is an old, but anyways, from the, you see a small yellow dot. That's where 99% of the crop yields exist. The rest of them are the last 10%. So if you take a small uh, early mature plant producing 320 crop yields, that means in 1,100 hectares, there's 32 more plants out there somewhere and you gotta go find them. So a lot of your time spent searching these highly remote areas where there's an expectation that you're not going to find those targets, but you have to find those targets. Based on early calculations, and this is definitely a moving target, but based on this area calculation and our knowledge of how much flight time it takes and how many plants we need to treat, we estimate uh, an investment of over $270,000 in management imposed over two decades, again, recognizing uh, seed bank extinction uh, taking that long, and you are committed to finding every last plant. So a quarter million dollars, you get one early mature plant and you just committed a uh, quarter million dollars in management for the next two decades. You're basically half your entire career for most of us. I kind of alluded to this, but the spatial assignment of coverage and total effort is interesting in itself. This is not, uh, this is a density function, this uh, area, uh, and it shows that target density is highest at point zero, at ground zero, and that's where most of your coverage is going to, to take place. So you are in, your highest level of intensity is, is at, the, at the point of where the mature plant was found, and then it decays to the amount of flight time searching in area just to confirm that there's no target in that location. With all that said, that's a very small area, and in fact, 91% of your total effort, again, is focused on the peripheral area occupied by only 1% of the target. So that's the real expense, is finding that 1%. You could, it's very economical to go in and treat 90% of those uh, targets. If the expense is looking for the last one out here. Okay, so what have we accomplished? Uh, this is just focusing on the HPT from 2012 to 2016. Uh, we invested over $682,000 in county, state, and federal sources of funding, conducting over 100 HPT operations at this point, eliminating over 20,000 targets. And based on our knowledge of spatial dispersal, we are, we are protecting 20,000 hectares of watershed. For every one plant we control, we are protecting 1,200 hectares. When you spatially assign each one of those targets treated, this is the area that's being protected, everything in blue and in red. This is what we've accomplished. The dollar value to that, again, is the moving target, and I'm still working out what the, what's an honest number, and I'm working with the economists to figure this out but it is definitely in the hundreds of millions and potentially in the billions of dollars in a highly conservative operation where mission where you're, you, are, um, you are committed to eliminating every single Myconia plant. Okay, so where have we failed? So out of the 20,000 targets treated, 226 of those were incipient mature targets. So we've added impact to 15,000 hectares of watershed. So we are constantly struggling. Obviously the mission is to eliminate targets before they reach maturity. We aren't quite there yet. And I, where I wish I was at today is I would like to be able to tell you we need to ramp up this much to make sure that we get zero mature targets. Where I'm confident is, is I think we have all the numbers to be able to calculate that. I, um, I need to surround myself with smarter people than myself, and uh, that's my intent, and we know who they are, uh, and it'll take a village to figure it out. But ultimately, what we're going to be able to say is 
this is how much we are, this is how much we're investing in managing for myconia. This is what we need to ramp up to to achieve that goal. Um, and we're getting close. I've made attempts before and I've made uh, honest, educated attempts and it's an evolving process. And again, we'll be much smarter about it if uh, I lock myself in a closet and figure it out and then I share it with smarter people than myself. Okay, so I don't know what time is. JC, you pull the shepherd's stroke if I'm going over, but I only need about five more minutes. Uh, you're uh, good. We have more. until the top of the hour. Okay, very good. Um, I want to make sure there's room for questions for anyone interested. But uh, going back to 1995, this is, this is the distribution of points that were recorded starting in 1992. So this is about, um, this is about three, year, three to four years of, of, of modest management identifying the location or distribution of myconia from its original introduction in 1970. This is what was recorded. This raster, this radial distribution, is a basic calculation of the dispersal kernel with knowledge of the information presented in this, in this talk. We talked about a dispersal kernel that extended out to 1,980 meters, or approximately 2,000 meters. These are basic, these are buffers that reach that far out. These are based on generations. So if from 1970 to 1991, we basically have approximately four to five generations of reproductive plants uh, from the point of introduction to the point when management started. And if that's the case, this is the, this is the constricted area of how far myconia would have, would have invaded within that time period except that we have all these points out here beyond that natural dispersal function that's been calculated. How is that the case? These are layers of the, of the road systems in, Ma in Maui and also the flume system. And what you'll recognize and what, I, and what I'm noticing, is all these points associated uh, spatially to a lot of these features. This is what might be described as a stratified dispersal strategy um, where uh, you have biologically driven dispersal as talked about with, uh, with Ava fauna and fruit givery uh, along with human mediated stochastic events uh, including the, those highly remote areas where people purposely planted them but also, I suspect, and I'm speculating, that the Hana Highway and the Koalau Flume System also serve as a way to uh, distribute these stochastic long-distance dis dispersal to new novel locations well beyond natural frugivory and dispersal by birds. So already by 1995, send it out to what probably is a suitable habitat. That's even before any management took place. Again, a lot of speculation and using pictures to prove a point, but mostly for discussion because I think there's validity in, in, um, in what might have occurred and understanding why that is. And if you look a little closer, uh, we have top left corner notice, the bloom system and Hana Highway, this is windward side. Hana V is here for those who didn't know where and what this is, and this is the Kolalau Gap. Um, basically, what you should know is that 99% of all the myconia plants that have been treated are below the flume system and below Hunt Highway, or I'm sorry, below the flume system. Uh, anything above that, we can assume, you know, it, it, that gravity plays a major role. Uh, and that anything moving above that gluten system is probably bird dispersed and, and mediated by avifauna. Again, showing incipient populations strongly associated with uh, bloom system could have been a breach in the system, picked up seed from the infested areas and carried it over into this novel location here. Here we see a major outbreak at the mouth of, of uh, intake, which is interesting because you would think that 
Myconia was actually uh, depositing here, it, it, it could be that Myconia was introduced when this, when this uh, auxiliary system was installed, so uh, contamination by humans during this installation process. Again, pure speculation, but again, just trying to highlight some of the spatial patterns associated with these uh, human structures that could obviously facilitate uh, these stochastic events. Okay, reviewing the concepts. Oops, sorry. Um, oops, backing up. Uh, knowledge of phenology, fecundity, and dispersal and longevity for myconia has in enhanced our capacity to measure impact on the landscape and allows us to project long-term strategies. The HPT platform has encouraged greater investment in surveillance, leading to improved calculation in target dispersal and recruitment. And we've accepted and we understand very well that our detectability is imperfect using manned aerial surveillance, but can be compensated with frequent intervention. So in other words, we just don't fly enough. And the elephant in the room is standby because this is where unmanned aerial systems can play a major role at the next phase in technology adoption that could really change the game in my telling engine. Because clearly what I'm saying is we need to be looking more than we're finding. Uh, and that is critical. It is, it, it is extremely valuable and a worthy investment to use resources proving that an area does not have myconia. It is just as valuable as searching areas to find myconia. It is critical. You have to prove the negative. And, and it's uh, very expensive with manned aircraft. We're proving it to be economical. But if unmanned aerial systems can displace some of that and or the totality of that, the economics change substantially. <clears throat> Challenges for uh, comprehensive containment. Under, com under committed management in the first four years of a mature plant, uh, discovery could lead to catastrophic long-term consequences. Once you allow progeny to reach maturity, you have exponentially enhanced your problem with long-term investment. Uh, limited resources, forced decisions with opportunity costs, recon, and low-density perimeters at the expense of target reduction in high-density centers. Today, Myconia management strategy for EMW is retreating from broad com comprehensive containment to more finite asset protection. Uh, this is still subject to debate uh, and communication with our leaders in who make these decisions. But we know that uh, it's always going to be, the challenge is always going to be to find enough resources to compensate for what we're calculating are the ne necessities to achieve comprehensive containment. So finite asset, asset protection is identifying those critical areas within the watershed that have to be protected. The cheapest form of management is investing in areas where myconia doesn't exist and keeping it out. Um, so again, going back to that invert invasion curve, we are definitely somewhere at the three-quarter mark, uh, and we have a long slog to getting back to effective, cost-effective containment strategy in my opinion, and, that, and that's only my opinion, and others are, have, would, would be in the right to just, uh, take the counter to that. Um, can't do it alone. We do it with partnerships. Uh, collaborators include the Nelson Paint Company, who manufactures HVC projectiles. Without them, we don't do this. Uh, Dow AgriSciences, it's their product. If they didn't want this manufactured, they'd tell me, go fly a kite. Uh, the ISC, uh, a highly advanced management operation on each of the islands, and it's a pleasure of working with NIST since I've been here since 2009, um, and uh, bringing in new partners uh, with New Hero, understanding the economics of the management that we are conducting and making smarter decisions with the finite resources we have available. Now, obviously, the National Park Service has really took the lead early on and continue to play a role in Myconia management on Maui with the vicinity of Haleakala National Park. And, of course, the, the support we get financially through the Forest Service, uh, the HISC, and the County of Maui, which is 
substantial. Um, and so with that, I say mahalo. And I think at this point, if there's time, I'd love to entertain any questions from, from the group. Thanks, guys, for your attention.